How many of you have ever gotten a jump start from somebody? I see those hands. How many of you have ever given a jump start to somebody? How many of you have ever called AAA? How many of you wish you... No, okay, all right. So, so here's the thing about jumper cables. We have a lady in our church. I talked about jumper cables about a year ago. And a lady in our church came to me and she said, my dad invented jumper cables. Now you got to realize, people say all kinds of things to me. I didn't think she was a liar, but I'm thinking, okay, I got to hear this story. The next week, she brings me a newspaper article about her dad and the first time he ever uh, uh, jump-started a car. By the way, he invented jumper cables, and then a friend of his patented it. It's always good to have friends, isn't it? So anyway, but in the old days, this is how they did it, the first jumper cables. Basically, it didn't have two cables. You would pull the cars up to each other and touch bumpers. And this is what he said to his friend, which was in the article. He said to his friend, we're either going to start this car or we're going to (laughs) die. Isn't it good to have friends like that? Bill, you've been a mechanic a long time. You've got friends just like that, don't you? Right? It's all part of the deal. And here's the thing. We all, we all need a jump start sometimes. We all need somebody to help us. But there's a balance in this. Listen. If, if your friend, if you gave your friend a jump start and then he said, okay, now follow me to the store because I'm going to need another jump start. Uh, th- that's not the deal. Now follow me to the store because my battery's not working well. I'll drive next to you with the cables attached. That's not going to go well. Some of us, and I'm going to talk about this part of the way through the message, Some of you are good at giving jump starts, but you have given somebody too many jump starts and you're not taking care of yourself. You're destroying the battery and you're enabling somebody instead of helping them. So there's always this balance. And so today we're going to talk about this idea of helping somebody. So let me ask you this question. I want you to think of a person who carried you during a hard time in your life. Who, who was it in, at a time in your life that, that carried you, that helped you through difficulty, who was there for you in a struggle, in a trial? This story I'm going to talk about today is one of my favorite stories in the Bible because I think it describes what we should be as a church. So if you go here to church, you're going to hear this story unapologetically at least twice a year. Because we all need to remember what these guys did for their friend and what we're responsible to do for our friends. We all need others to help us sometimes. How many of you have ever needed help? Okay, just wanted to make sure you were awake. Randy, you need help right now. So just... It's donkey day, Randy, so I just thought you and I are relating to each other very closely. All right, number one. So here's the first point today. Look for the needs around you. Luke 5, verse 18, one verse. Here we start. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. A paralyzed man, a man who can't walk. On, we don't know that he was fully paralyzed, but we know he couldn't walk. On a mat and, and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. Now, several things had to happen. Number one, these guys had to look around. They had to look around. So I want you to enact, uh, uh, act out something Right now, you don't have to get your phone out. If you want to, you can. But I want you to show me what you look like when you're looking at your cell phone. Ready? One, two, three, go. One, two, three, go. Boy, that was awesome from up here. I got to see the top of heads, foreheads, right? And when you look around, even in traffic... You will see people with their head down. I actually was behind somebody on the way to take my mom to a doctor's appointment in uh, uh, Altamont Springs, driving down Red Bug Lake Road. And, and Red Bug Lake Road, you've got to go exactly 45 at all times or you will catch every single light. They know that. They time it that way because they're evil. And the people in front of me, the light turned green and both people were looking at their phones. So I pushed them into the intersection. No, I didn't. I I didn't even say any bad words. My wife was very impressed. I talked to Jesus about them. So here's the thing. In order to help people, you ready for this? You ready for this? You have to notice them. Did you hear me? 
in order to help people, you have to know that there. Some of you have a cubicle next to somebody that you don't even say hi to. Some of you have neighbors you've never met. Now, I know for some of you, it's your neighbor's fault. I'm sure it's always your neighbor's fault. But some of you don't know anybody you work with or know very few people you work with. In order to look for needs around you, here it is. You ready? This is huge. I would love to tell you you need the Holy Spirit. That would be great. I would love to tell you that you need God's love. That'd be great. But here's what you need. Look. God has placed people all around you with needs, all kinds of needs. And the key is not this huge event that needs to take place. The key is looking, noticing, paying attention just to the people around you who are hurting. In Philippians 2, it says it this way, do nothing out of selfish ambition, which basically means you're motivated. What do I want? What do I want? What do I want? What do I want? Not to pick on car salesmen, but come on. You go to car salesmen, they will tell you anything they think you want to hear, right? You go in there and they will tell you, if, if they hear you say something about a certain car, that's the only car they're going to show you. Why? Because they know what they want, and that's to sell you a car. You might happen to get some of what you want, but the only reason you're getting what you want is because they want that what they want. Now, I know whoever's a car dealer in this room is not that way. You are the most wonderful, caring, loving, unselfish person there is. But I'm talking about all the other people. Do nothing out of selfish, I just made somebody mad, I'm sure. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain, vain, vanity, looking at yourself, selfies all the time, right? Vain conceit, rather, listen to what it says next, in humility, and this is the word for having a humble mind, not thinking of yourself all the time, of humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. How are you going to help others? You have to look outside of you. And when we're having a bad day, sometimes it's hard to look outside of ourselves. When we're struggling with a difficulty, when we're struggling emotionally, physically, but can I tell you something that I've learned over time? When you look in the Bible, when Peter walked on water, the seas were rough. Now, I might have said to Jesus, hey, could you calm the water first? And too often, we want God to calm the water around us, and then we'll help others. But sometimes, in order for the water to get calm, you've got to help others. So as you're going through a struggle, you don't not help people. That's wrong English, but you got the idea. Sorry, Mike. When you're going through difficulty, you can't just stop helping others. Listen, when you're going through drought, keep planting seeds. Because eventually the seeds you plant are going to grow, but you have to plant them even when life is hard and you're going through difficulty. And the truth is, for you and for me, sometimes helping somebody else pulls me out of the struggle, the difficulty, the depression, the discouragement, the frustration. By the way, at any given time, no one's life is perfect. I'm sure if I asked you to write something down that's not going well right now, you could think of something, especially if you're over 50. There's something broken today. Something's not working. Something's not working. Something's painful. I've been working at the house. My hands feel like I have hot dog fingers. So here's the first prayer for you. Ask God to make you sensitive to needs. There's, there's people around you right now. Do you know why Jesus washed the disciples' feet? You ready for this? This is theologically huge. Here it is. They were dirty. So ask God, how can I help somebody or bless somebody or encourage somebody? By the way, it doesn't have to be complicated either. Sometimes we think it's got to be this common. Sometimes it's just a text. I mean, a text takes 12 seconds. If you're not a teenager, if you're a teenager, it's like three. Right? Some of you are still texting like this. 
Listen to what Rick Warren says. Faithful servants never retire. You can retire from your career, but you'll never retire from serving God. By the way, I've talked to so many retired people who tell me they're busier now than they were, which is just more incentive for me to never quit working. <laughs> it's just you get somebody different to tell you what to do. Is that how it works? Is that all right? Number two, gosh, I got to be quiet today. All right. Helping requires two things. It requires sacrifice, but it also requires boundaries. Listen, anything that you do, you're going to struggle sometimes. I don't care if it's something fun. I was walking the dogs this week down the street, and as I walked the dogs, this mom with her little boy on his bicycle in, a, in shorts with a helmet riding down the street, and all of a sudden I hear that dreaded yell that you give when you come off of your bike. He has scraped both knees on the asphalt, blood coming down, both knees. Yeah, that whole, that whole thing. All I could think was, how many times did I do that as a kid? And I was thinking, ow, that's like the word. I could feel it. I could feel it. And I watched the mom who went down and, and gave him a hug and then said, get back on your bike. It was awesome. And you know what he did? You ready? He got back on his bike. Do you know why he got it back on his bike? Because he wanted to. Too many times when it comes to doing something difficult for other people, the reason we quit is not just because it's difficult, it's because if we're honest, we just didn't want to. So sometimes what we need to pray is, God, would you give me a desire to really help and bless people? But you have to have boundaries in that, just like you wouldn't follow somebody with jumper cables. The mom did not pick up the kid and follow him down the street the rest of the time. What'd she do? She helped him get back on the bike, but guess what? He was on his own again. We have to find those proper boundaries. So here's what happens next. When they could not find a way, so they're trying to take their friend to Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, listen to this. They went up on the roof. Time out. Listen, this is what I'm talking about, boundaries. They carried a guy up the stairs on the outside of a house onto the roof. These guys had to, you ready? Be healthy enough. They had to take care of themselves enough to be able to help someone else. Sometimes if we're honest, the reason we can't help others is because we haven't taken care of ourselves. You know, when you're on a plane and the, they say that if the oxygen mask falls, then pray because you're going to see Jesus. Is that what your speech is? Right? They say if the oxygen mask falls, put it on you and then on your kid. Why? Because if you don't take care of you, you can't take care of somebody else. These guys had enough strength to walk this guy up onto the roof. I got to be honest. I couldn't do this. I'm hurting just thinking about this. My back hurts just thinking about what they did. I would have been like, nope, sorry, we're headed home. Too bad. Today's not walking day for you. By the way, part of what I wondered is maybe one of these guys was already healed by Jesus. I guess you liked that. <laughs> when they could not find, they, they went up on the roof. And what they do? They lowered him on the mat. We find out in Mark chapter 2 that they dug through the roof. Hey, Brian, you've been digging at your house. I saw some pictures on Facebook. How you feeling? You a little sore. Yeah, a little old, right? These guys are digging through the roof. I am sure it's sweaty, hot miserable. What are they doing? They're helping the guy. But listen to this. They lowered him on his mat through the tiles to the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. And I love this. When Jesus saw, not his faith, their faith, you can see four faces, sweaty, dripping, looking down. What's going to happen now? He said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Which, by the way, if I was the guy on the roof, I'd be a little disappointed at this point. Like, thanks for that, but we didn't bring him here because it was a sin problem. It was a walking problem. Sins are forgiven. That's wonderful. Praise you, Jesus. But that's not really what we're here for. I mean, we could have done that at home, right? And so they drop him. He says, he says, friend, your sins are forgiven. And then it continues. In 
Philippians chapter 2, it says this, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Now, I love this word grumbling. Grumbling it literally means to have a secret debate. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Grumbling is what you do when you are home and nobody's washed the dishes and you decide it's up to you and everybody else is an idiot and you're the only smart person in the house and you do the dishes and you do and maybe somebody will wake up and notice that you are doing and nobody cares. But you are having a secret debate and boy, you're right. Congratulations. Do nothing without Grumbling or arguing. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Why? So you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Would you say our generation is warped and crooked? Yeah. By the way, this is first century church. It was also warped at that time. You, you think it's something new. We feel like it's a, our country has never been like this. Yes, it has. Yes, it has. Our world has never been like this. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure it has. Get over yourself. Congratulations, you live now. Wee, it's so tough. Your internet was slow. It's like 73 in here. Oh, I'm too hot, I'm too cold. Wee. Sorry. Receive difficulty as a blessing. If you're a kid and you fall off the bike, guess what? You're glad to get back on, bleeding knees and all. Kid went right past me, drip, drip, drip. It was crazy. I was like, it's a lot of blood. I'm like, kid, that kid's a bleeder. <laughs> no, no, he's fine. He's fine as far as I know. I didn't follow him home. I, I would like to hear the dad speech when he got home. Well, that's what happens. Louis Giglio says this, God has plans and purposes for each of our lives, but the beauty is he doesn't call us and leave us on our own. Jesus actually lives in us to do what? To pull off the amazing things that he's invited us into. God wants to use you to do amazing things, but guess what? You got to show up. You got to pay attention. Number three, expect critics. Expect opinions when you help anybody. When you help somebody, it's easy to say, I'm not helping anymore because the last time I helped, this happened. Oh, get over yourself. Do you realize that there was somebody who helped you that you never thanked? Have you ever thanked?
coming into town. Hosanna. Does anybody do that when you come walking towards them? Do they see Jesus? Do they see somebody who's there to help or somebody who's there to criticize? Do they see somebody who's there, who's there to lift them up or somebody who's there to put them down, to push them down? Your final challenge is this. Pray and persevere. Remember who helped you. So I want to end with this today on Passion Week. I want you to think of one person this week that you can help. Maybe you just can encourage them. Maybe you can bring them lunch. Maybe you can give them 50 bucks secretly. Maybe you can go out of your way just to be a blessing. Think of somebody and then, because Jesus died for you, do it this week. You might get criticized. It might not go the way you want. They may not appreciate it. But do what God's called you to this week. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, or you're watching online, you've never given your life to Christ, you can do that this week. I'd love to talk to you about what it means that Jesus died for your sins and rose again, so that when you surrender your life to Him, you say, Jesus, I want to live for you. The Bible says that He exchanges your dead life for His life. He takes your sin and gives you His righteousness. You don't deserve it. And that's why He does it. Because we need Him. I'd love to talk to you after the service if that's what you need. I pray if you're a believer and as I talked, you thought of some people who need some encouragement or need a blessing. Do that this week. Follow through with it. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word. Thank you for all the people over the years at this church who've carried me during difficult times, during struggles. And Father, those who carry others. I pray, Lord, for those today who need to be carried, that they would know your presence because of the other believers around them who are carrying them. Lord, I pray also you'd make us very aware of those around us who need to be carried, that we, even in our weakness, would have strength to carry them from your spirit. We thank you for this church and this place. Bring many next week, not only here, but to come to know you. Help them to find their way home to you. In Jesus' name, amen.